السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان وأقيم الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسر الميزان رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين Inshallah, my intention tonight is not to give you a super long lecture. I think I want to hear more from you this evening after I give my initial thoughts for hopefully less than 45 minutes. I'd like to take about 15 minutes worth of questions from all of you, inshallah ta'ala, about some of the ideas that I hope to share with you today. I do think that some of the ideas that I'm going to share with you tonight, inshallah, are a little bit different than what you might have been used to hearing. And I, though I have talked about these things before and uh, in different forums in the United States, I don't think, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, any of this stuff is on YouTube. So it is probably new for a lot of you, inshallah ta'ala. The Qur'an teaches us a lot of different kinds of concepts in very unique ways. And tonight we're going to explore one of those ways. Some of you are familiar with the ayat I began today with when I recited the Arabic portion of the, the masnoon part of this talk. I actually recited a couple of ayat from Surah Al-Rahman. And in Surah Al-Rahman, the arguments are actually pretty unique. The beginning of it, the gist of it all is that there are non-Muslims, actually not just non-Muslims, non-believers, who are refusing to accept the call of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the reason that they have for not accepting the call is it's not convincing enough for them to believe in a book where they haven't seen anything miraculous. They say that they're only going to believe if they see. And I've talked about that part of it at least extensively. That Allah Azza wa in this surah, in Surah Al-Rahman basically says, you're human beings. You can reason at a higher level. You don't have to be convinced of something just because you've seen it you can actually reach conclusions by reasoning, by thinking about something, right? So the human ability to communicate through language makes us more sophisticated than other creatures, right? So we can reason with each other through language and talk about things that we can't even physically see. This is something that happens in universities all the time, higher institutions of learning all the time. You're learning literature and history, you're, for example, even let's take history. You learn a lot about history without actually seeing the events. You learn about them through reading about them, through discussing them. You learn a lot about justice without actually seeing the abstract concept of justice. You learn about it through discussion, through learning, right? So much philosophy and wisdom is taught through language without actually resorting to something physically that you can see. Amin Ahsan Islahi, a great scholar, just talking about this concept, he said something brilliant. He said, you know, animals, they only reason based on their five senses. So for instance, if you're, there's a fire in a building, human beings can be told through a mic system or something, there's a fire, please exit the building. I don't have to see the fire. If I, if I hear the announcement, it's enough for me. But a cat or a mouse or a dog, they're not gonna leave the building until they smell the flames or they see the fire, you understand? So when people said that we're only going to believe when we see, Allah Azza wa Jal responded, Ar-Rahman allam al-Qur'an, khalaq al-insan, allamahu al-bayan. Ar-Rahman, he in fact, he taught the Qur'an. Yes, and the Qur'an should be enough because he created the human being, not an animal. And the human being has been given the ability to use communication. That's the, one of the rationales of the beginning of the surah. But I want to take it a step further today. That step further is really, really important. And I think one of the most important fundamental principles of the Qur'an. And that is that revelation, Qur'an came. Qur'an came to give us iman. But the miracles of Allah that should lead you to Iman, that should lead you to the conclusion that in fact there is a God, that in fact there is Allah, and that He will hold you accountable, all of that you could have concluded yourself without revelation, even without the Qur'an. Where should you get that information from? It actually should come from you thinking about the creation around you. 
So when they said, now listen to this part carefully now, when they said we will only believe when we what? When we see. We're only going to believe when we see. Allah says, really? Because you have plenty to see. الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ بِحُسْبَانِ وَالنَّجْمُ وَالشَّجَرُ يَسْجُدَانِ وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ الْمِيزَانِ لَا تَتْغَوْ فِي الْمِيزَانِ The ayat start talking about the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon are following a perfect calculation. Allah says, you want to see something amazing that will make you believe? Why don't you look at the sun and the moon? Subhanallah. What an argument being made by Allah. You know what He's saying? What He's saying is, you are denying the ayat of the Qur'an now. But actually, every single morning, you've been denying the ayah of the sun. And every single night, you've been denying the ayah of the moon. Your denial is not something new. You've been in denial for a long time. And only now, when revelation came, the ayat of the Qur'an came. You're denying those too. But the denial began a long time ago. This is not a new kufr for you. This is not a new disbelief for you. This is old. This is a continuation of something you've been doing from before. Subhanallah. But I want to highlight something about Surah Al-Rahman in this beginning. In addition to just the denial of the ayat. Allah says, الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ بِحُسْبَانِ Now think about this. We when, we, when we talk about responsibility, right? That tonight's talk is about responsibility. Responsible people have a lot of respect for their time. Irresponsible people waste their time. That's basically the difference between responsible people and irresponsible people. Responsible people get to work on time. Irresponsible people show up late. Responsible students finish their homework on time, finish, get ready for the exam on time, etc, etc. Irresponsible people don't. That's fundamentally the difference between responsibility and irresponsibility. Responsible Muslims wake up in the morning for Fajr. Irresponsible Muslims don't. Isn't that the case? So responsibility has a lot to do with respect for time, doesn't it? Now think about this. There are two basic calculations for time. There's the clock and there's the calendar. There's the clock and there's the calendar. On, in a, within a day, throughout a day, what do you rely on? The clock. And within the week, and within the month, and within the year, what do you rely on? The calendar, right? So you basically have two functions of time that you base all of your responsibilities on. Look, you need to finish the assignment in the next couple of weeks. You're gonna look at the calendar. You have to get to work by 8 a.m. You're gonna look at what? The clock. At a daily, at a daily scale, you're looking at the clock. At a monthly, weekly, etc. scale, you're looking at the calendar. Allah said, what two things in the sky? Ash-shamsu wal-qamaru bi-husban. The sun and the moon follow a very precise calculation. The sun is actually our clock. The sun rises and our salat clock is fajr. The sun gets a little higher and our salat clock says wuhr. The sun is actually keeping us, keeping, keeping our revolutions of the clock, isn't it? And guess what we do, especially for Muslims, the Islamic calendar revolves around what? The moon. The sun and the moon are actually our clock and our calendar. Our entire sense of responsibility to Allah as Muslims, and even beyond as Muslims, as human beings, revolves around these two things. On the one hand, the sun on a daily basis, and on the other hand, the moon on a monthly basis, the cyclical, the cycles of the moon, right? So it's like Allah in this, if you think of, you know how you have a wall in your house, and you hang a clock on the wall, and you hang a calendar on the wall, well Allah has a ceiling for us, the sky, and He hung a clock on it called the sun, and He hung a calendar on it called the moon. And therefore we never, we're, we as human beings should never be irresponsible with our time, because here's a clock, and here's a calendar, you can never miss it. <laughs> It's like, where did I put my clock? Oh, it's kind of bright up there, it's there. <laughs> you know? Subhanallah. What we're learning in these ayat, what we're learning already in these ayat is a, a genuine respect for time. Respect for time. Allah says, you don't seem to, seem to notice the sense of urgency in believing. 
Why haven't you really thought about the precise calculations of the sun and the moon? Why haven't you reflected on them? And thinking deeply about the sun and the moon is the first exercise I wanted to do today because we are going to talk about responsibility. He says, وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ بِحُسْبَان Let's talk about this husban a little bit. The word husban in this ayah can be understood fundamentally in two ways. Our mufassirun traditionally have gone one of two ways talking about the word husban in this ayah. I'll explain both of them. The first of them is husban comes from hisab, which is calculation. So the sun and the moon are, are, de are determined or committed to very precise, extremely accurate calculation. That's what Allah is saying. So what Allah is saying then is, and we learned this from other places in the Qur'an, what is the most honored creation of Allah? وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمِ We honored the son of Adam. Human beings are the most honored creation. Allah Azza wa Jal gave us لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Many of you know that ayah. Allah created the human being in the best possible form. We're the best creation. If we're the best creation, then we're supposed to reflect the best qualities. We're supposed to reflect the best, best qualities. Now I'm gonna stop for a second on this subject. And I'm gonna go on a tangent. But it's a really important tangent to build these ideas. Okay, so I want you to stay with me as best you can. Because I'm in Bahrain, and I talked about this yesterday too, so I'm gonna pick up from where I left off. You guys are very familiar with brand names, yes? So if you see somebody walking around with an iPhone, even from a distance, can you tell it's an iPhone? You could tell. If somebody's driving a BMW, those of you that are into cars, they're driving an M5. They're a little bit far away, four or five cars ahead. Can you tell it's an M5 in, if you're into cars? You can tell. You can tell a brand. The thing is, there are certain really good manufacturers. They're really famous designers, manufacturers. If you're into fashion, you see somebody's clothes, you can tell who the designer is. If you're into art, you can see a painting and you can tell who the painter is or what kind of painting it is. If you're into architecture, you can look at a building and say, I think I know who the architect is. You understand? Every designer has a certain signature, a certain style. Like Apple has a certain style as a company. Right? They design things with a certain kind of style. And you can tell, okay, that's an Apple kind of product. You, can, you see what I'm saying? So a car company has a brand, signature, a design. You know, an architect has it, an artist has it. Well, Allah Azza wa Jal is an architect to the universe. He's a designer of the universe. He's a creator of it, a manufacturer of it. And like every manufacturer has a signature, right? You could tell their style. Allah also has a style in how He designs things, how He makes things. And according to this ayah, we are learning something about the style that Allah likes. The style that Allah likes is things that are precise. Precise, that follow a particular calendar, that follow a particular clock schedule, that don't delay the schedule, that stick to a time. And He likes that kind of design so much that human beings, our life on this earth, is actually, it revolves around these two creations of Allah, which should remind us how important it is to Allah, or how much He likes that His creations stick to time, that they have respect for time. So if you and I feel like we have a lot of free time, or we can do whatever we want with our time, the reminder against that is not a long lecture. The reminder against that is actually the sun and the moon. That's the reminder in the ayah. It's very deep. What Allah is saying is very, very deep. But that's the first understanding. The second understanding of the word husban. Beautiful. In Surah Al-Kahf, there are two gardeners. They have a conversation with each other. One's a little arrogant and full of himself because he's got a lot of money. And he makes the other one feel bad. And when the other one feels bad, he says, why are you showing off like this? You know? Same word. The word husban in the Arabic language also means 
destruction. Actually, one of the rare meanings of the word is destruction. Al-halak. But it's a specific kind of destruction. A destruction that is at a very particular time. You may not be into cartoons, but I am. And in some cartoons, they have the, uh, the TNT, and it's got a little... You know what I'm talking about? And there are some that have the, the TNT, and it's got a timer on it. Right? 10, 9, 8, and Tom better get out of there really quickly because Jerry set it up already. Right? The idea that it will go off at a very particular what? Time. Allah is saying in this ayah, the sun and the moon are about to be destroyed at a very particular time and they have reached almost the de destruction stage. Why is he saying that? He's saying that because Right before he said he taught the Qur'an, yes? Who did he teach the Qur'an to? Who did, he, who did Allah teach the Qur'an to? Who's the first student of the Qur'an on this earth? Rasulullah wasallam. And Rasulullah wasallam is the, one of the greatest signs, if not the greatest sign of Judgment Day. Of all of the signs of Judgment Day, the Judgment Day for humanity is coming near. The most powerful of those signs, إِنَّهُ لَعِلْمٌ لِلسَّاعَةِ He's the ultimate sign of Judgment Day. And what's the, him coming means, him and Qur'an are the same. In other words, the Rasul coming sallallahu alayhi wa to us is the same as the Qur'an coming. The Qur'an coming is the same as the Rasul coming sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For us nowadays, we separate those two, right? So the Qur'an is the book, and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa is a book of seerah, he's a book like Bukhari and Muslim and you know, Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah, it's, that's, that's the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But at the time of the Sahaba, where are they getting Qur'an from? From the same mouth. Where are they getting Sunnah from? From the same mouth. To them it's one. It's not two entities, it's one entity that they're experiencing. So when we talk about Qur'an being taught, and we talk about the Messenger coming Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba, the Quraysh, everybody else, they don't actually separate those two entities. They can't. They're getting them from the same source, you understand? So Allah just said He taught the Qur'an, which means He gave the, one of the greatest signs of Judgment Day. And the disbeliever said, I will only believe when I what? When I see it. Allah says, the only big thing left to see now is that the sun and the moon are about to be destroyed. You're looking for something to see? That's the only major event left. You understand the logic of the ayat? It's incredible. It's incredible. Now when Allah says the only major event left to see after the Qur'an being taught is the sun and the moon collapsing, them falling apart. Is that supposed to give you a sense of urgency? Absolutely. It's supposed to put you in a sense of seriousness. الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ husban, Which gives you another appreciation of وَالنَّجْمُ وَالشَّجَرُ yasjudan. The next ayah, وَالنَّجْمُ وَالشَّجَرُ yasjudan. This is really important too. And I don't want to go into a long discussion about what Najm wa Shajr Yashudan. There's a lot of tafsir, a lot of opinions about what is meant by these two, these two things. The tree, you know, the, the star and the tree make sajda. There are lots of opinions on this. And we don't have the time this evening to go through all of those opinions. But I'll give you just one of them that's really interesting. And it's in line with the discussion as it continues. And that is that the Arabs, back in the day, in the ancient times, not today, but in, in the ancient times. They did not have beautiful buildings in their landscape. They did not have highways that are lit. They did not have any of this stuff. So when they, they, there wasn't much things to look at outside in Arabia that were beautiful. Except in the desert, if you find a tree, it really catches your eye, huh? Like I've been looking for a tree for a while since I got here. Right, so a tree will really catch your eye. And at night time, what is the most beautiful thing in desert life? The star, the two things that are mentioned, an najm wa shajar, are actually the most beautiful symbol of beauty in the day, which is, or in the night rather, the star, and the most beautiful symbol of beauty in the day for the Arab landscape, which is the tree, which catches his eye. And he says about both of them, they are going to be making sajda. The mudari' form can be thought about as present tense or future tense. And one of the interpretations of these ayat is, when that judgment day comes, you will notice these two things that you look up to, that are symbols of beauty for you, falling down into what? Sajda, stars are going to be falling, trees are going to be falling. 
when that day comes, crazy. When that time comes, when najmu wa shajaru yashuda. Of course, the other interpretation is that even today, they are in a state of sajda if you reflect on it. But that's a longer discussion. I'm not going there yet. Now the part that I really want to talk to you about. That's really the crux of what I want to share with you today. How deeply Qur'an presents ideas. The idea of reflection on the Qur'an and deriving benefit from the Qur'an. You know, when you really get into this subject and extract what our amazing tradition has to offer, if you're students of philosophy or poetry or literature, you'll be blown away by how Qur'an presents things, really. This is one of those places to me. He says, وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا This is actually a unique thing in Arabic grammar. It's called الْمَشْغُولُ anhu. Those of you that are into Arabic grammar, the maf'ul bihi is mentioned twice. Wasama'a, and then it's repeated, rafa'aha. The dhameer is mentioned again, it's twice. Once before and once after, referring to the same thing. This is unusual of, in the Arabic language. And this is done in Arabic when, this, when someone is really proud of what they've done. To make it simple for you to understand, let's just say that you, a lousy student, did your homework for the first time. When you do your homework for the first like this time you actually did your homework. So you come to your mom and say, <laughs> Homework, I did this. You are so proud of your homework, you say, Homework, I did it. You refer to it a couple of times because it's a matter of significance to you. Now I'm giving you a silly example to get a point across. The point is this kind of language is used when the doer really wants you to think about their accomplishment. It's not something easy that you should overlook. You should really pay attention to it. And Allah is the doer in this ayah. وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَ يَعْنِي Allah Azza wa Jal رَفَعَهَا The sky, Allah is the one who elevated, he, he elevated it, the sky itself. Have you thought about the sky? You said you're only gonna believe if you see. Have you looked at the sky? What about the sky? He says, وَوَضَعَ mizan." He raised it and put a scale down in it. This is where our conversation really begins. Allah wants us to reflect upon the sky. Has He already mentioned something about the sky in these ayat? What are the things that have come up that have to do with the sky already? Stars, Stars have come up. What else has come up that has to do with the sky? The sun and the moon, yes? So plenty of reference to the sky has already come up. And by the way, where does Qur'an come from? It comes from the sky. And now he's explicitly mentioning the sky, and mentioning how high it is. And then he says he put a scale in the sky. Mizan is used also for balance. You ever see a picture like at court, in court, of the two sides of a scale? You know, and the weird looking blind lady holding the two sides of the scale, right? That's, that's a mizan. Two sides of a scale that are balanced. Allah says He put a balance in the sky. But the, this, this idea of balance in the sky, He balanced the distance between the earth and the sun, the sun and the moon, the moon and the earth. He balanced all of these things and put them perfectly in place so life can exist on this earth. He put the stars at a perfect distance from us. He put this earth in a, in a, situa in a place in the galaxy perfect for life to exist. You, you know, life according to the atheist is an accident. The atheist argues life on this earth is an accident. This is one of the most statistical absurdities ever stated, that life is an accident. Statisticians, stati people that study statistics, not religious people, people that study statistics will tell you that is the most ridiculous claim in, st in stats, that the life on this universe is an, or in this earth is an accident. There was some organic soup, it was boiling for a long time, and all of a sudden a frog came out, or, you know. And I'm not gonna go into that subject by itself, maybe at another occasion one day. But it's, you will have to understand, this, this place was so beautifully balanced for life to exist, for us to exist, for the things around us to exist that Allah will then talk about in these ayat that are coming. But think about this. He put balance in the sky, right? And of course, the sky is a beautiful symbol of balance, of things in order and they stay in place. They stay where they're supposed to, right? The sun is very reliable. You are gonna be late to work, I'm gonna be late for salat, but the sun's not gonna be late for sunrise. I'm gonna be late by a day or two finishing my assignment, but the moon's not gonna be late. The new moon's gonna come out. 
You understand? It doesn't wait for you. Oh wait, he's not finished with his assignment. Hold on. Just wait, wait a minute, let him, let him wake up. Because Fajr is not going to wait for you. Aisha is not going to wait for you. Ramadan is not going to wait for you. Wait, he hasn't finished the entire season 3 yet. Don't let Ramadan start. Let him finish watching the series. Then we can get into Ramadan. <laughs> Not gonna happen. It doesn't wait for you. It's got a schedule and it follows it. And it's got a balance that it commits itself to. Now, one of the most incredible transitions in the Qur'an. Transitions in the Qur'an, you know what that means? The Arabic term is iltifat. Allah is talking about one thing, all of a sudden He starts talking about another thing. A lot of times when you're reading the English translation of the Qur'an, you're like, what just happened? How did you go from one thing to just a totally different subject? How, how does that make sense? That's what's happening in this ayah now. He says, وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ الْمِزَانِ أَلَّا تَطْغَوْ فِي الْمِزَانِ He made the sky, he raised the sky and put a scale in it, put balance in it, so you, you don't cheat and don't violate in when it comes to the balance. You don't cheat when it comes to the balance. You don't do wrong when it comes to the balance. Oh my God, wait, 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 what? We were just talking about the sky and now we're talking about who? You, me. And he's connecting these two things. He's saying the sky has something to do with you. If you understand this connection, you'll understand today's conversation. This was the whole point I was trying to get at. If you understand what I'm gonna get at now. The sky is perfectly balanced. And Allah says, I balanced it, and the reason I balanced it is so that you have lead a balanced life. Allah says, He made the sky balanced, so you lead a balanced life. That's what He's saying in Surah Rahman. Now what in the world does that mean? Imagine back in the day, you own a grocery store, and you sell vegetables, and bananas, and fruits, and whatever you sell, okay? And you are, you know, of course you put the weights on the one side, back in the day, and you put the fruits on the other side, until they get what? Balanced. Now you are a little bit of a cheater. So it says 2 kilograms, the weight says 2 kilograms, but it's actually 1.9 kilograms. So you give your customer less than what they pay for. And this is how you make a little bit of extra money. So you are technically cheating in the scales. Now there's a government official body that comes and makes sure that your scales are up, up to date and you're not cheating in them and all of this stuff. But you know what this ayah is saying? What official reminder is there that you should never cheat in the scales? What giant scale is always there? The sky. The store owner should never cheat in his scales and the only khutbah he needs is to look out the window. Oh yeah, the sky. Ugh. Okay, I better, be, I better be fair in my dealings. Because, now here's the connection now, because this scale that Allah put in the sky, so long as that is intact, you have a chance to do the right thing. When Allah breaks that scale, is there a day when Allah will break that scale of the sky, things will start falling apart? Yeah? When He breaks that scale, your scale will be raised. The scale of your deeds. Until that scale is intact, you have a chance to do the right thing. What Allah is saying in this ayah is that human beings, if they do serious thinking about the universe, then they will learn that they have to have respect for time, and they have to achieve balance in their life. Two lessons from the sky so far. Those are the two, I'm, that's, if I can talk to you about these two lessons, we're talking about responsibility. What are those two lessons again? From the sun, the moon, and the sky, we are learning number one, to respect time. And number two, to live a life of balance. To have a scale in our life. So now I'm going to talk to you about balance. I believe personally in my life and in your life, and in the life of this ummah, one of the biggest things missing is balance. We're missing balance. Men are missing balance. Women are missing balance. Children are missing balance. Teenagers are missing balance. Husbands are missing balance, and wives are missing balance. Parents are missing balance. Employers are missing balance. Employees are missing balance. People are missing balance. And we, each of you has a different scale. They're not all the same scale. 
So I have to at least walk you through a few of them. So who should I pick on first? I'll start with husbands. Sorry. If you're a husband and a father, by the way, how many husbands and fathers at the same time? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. I feel your pain. Okay, but I'm going to pick on us first. Look, we have a lot of things to balance. Your parents want your time, yes? Your mother wants your attention, your father wants your time, your wife wants your time, your children want your time, your job wants your time, masjid wants your time, the learning of deen needs your time, exercise needs your time, friends need your time, you yourself just to keep your sanity need some time for yourself. The, 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 the commute to work needs some time. Keeping up with your job and you know, learning more needs some time. Continuing education needs some... Oh my God. There are too many things that need... that are pulling at you. Give me, give me, give me. If you imagine each one of them is a chain on you. You are chained to like 20 things and each one of them is pulling at you until you're torn. Right? And it's really hard to achieve balance between all of those demands. And we're in the middle of it. Congratulations. We're in the middle of it. So our children many times feel like we don't give them enough time. And the wife feels like we don't give her enough time. And some of the wives are like, thank Allah he doesn't give me enough time. But <laughs> some other wives are like, no, I, he doesn't spend any time with me, he doesn't talk to me. He's always busy, he's always on the phone, he's always on the computer. Then your friends are like, you never hang out with us, you never give us any time. Then you go to Jum'ah and people, the Imam says, you should learn your deen. And you're like, I don't give learning any time. Then you go home from work early and the boss says, hey, you don't give the company any time. You know, everybody's telling you you're not doing enough. That's the job of a man, congratulations. Nobody will ever be happy with you. That is what we signed up for. <laughs> we don't tell our young men that when they're getting married, do we? <laughs> Congratulations, no one will ever be happy with you ever again. <laughs> but you know what? This balance, finding a balance between all of those poles, is your responsibility. And if you forget that responsibility from today on, you and I should just look at what? The sky. We should just look at the sky. SubhanAllah. Changes life, doesn't it? Just the way, our, the way Allah makes us look at the world changes. Now for, for men, I'll, I'll tell you something. What happens most of the time is it's not easy to balance those things. Sometimes you have a really good marriage. Some brother's like... <laughs> you <know? laughs> Sometimes you have a really good marriage, but your relationship with your father is pretty tough. Sometimes you have a really good job situation, but your marriage is really tough. It's not going well, you know. Sometimes your job is okay, family is okay, but you don't make any time for your friends. Or you don't do anything really for the deen or something like that, right? So when this imbalance happens, you know what most people do? Most people pick the things that they're good at, because you can't be good at everything, so you pick the th a couple of things that you're good at, and you start putting most of your time in that, and you start ignoring everything else that's not convenient, that you're not so good at. So you have a brother who is not very good with his wife. She's kind of upset with him. Right? So he's gonna be the guy that shows up five hours before the program, and starts reorganizing the chairs. And you ask him, what are you doing? It's, Fee sabi lillah, fi sabi lillah. I'm doing this for the sake of Allah. I'm volunteering. <laughs> Actually, <you're laughs> and he's not even going home after the program's done. The, the, the mas'ul is like, please, return the lights off, please get out of here. No, no, no. I want to stay here, fi sabilillah. That's, you, you got something at home that you're running from. You're not dealing with it. That's so you're busying yourself with other things. You're staying late at night, hanging out with friends, because you don't want to deal with the upset wife. There's a problem with that. There's a serious situation. Our children, people say, how do we raise our children right? How do we give them a proper Islamic education? How do we give, make sure that they live by Islam and all of that? Wallahi, for fathers, I'm still picking on fathers. The biggest thing that they need from us is our time. They just need our time. We need to spend time with them. Our relationships with our children have become so artificial. The only thing you talk to them about is, did you do your homework? 
How was school? And you don't even wait for the answer. How was school? Okay, it was good. Okay. Ugly baat, ugly baat. Did you eat dinner? Okay, go to sleep. Bitte, go to sleep. Say, Abbas gotta watch the news. Or bitte, Abbas gotta watch something that you shouldn't be watching. Go to sleep. <laughs> you know, we have a really shallow relationship with our children. We're supposed to be playing sports with our kids. We're supposed to be hanging out with our children. We should know what their favorite... If you're letting them play video games, you better play it with them. I'm not here to pass you a fatwa. But if you're gonna let them play, you better play with them. You better be better at it than they are. If you're gonna do Street Fighter, do Street Fighter, I don't care. But do it with them. Don't let, let, let them be on their own. You should know who their favorite character is. You should know all the special combos. You should know this stuff. That's, you're a dad, you should know this stuff. You should know who their favorite athlete is. What their favorite sport is, who their best friend is. You should know this stuff. This is your job. As, with your boys especially and also with your girls. And with your girls, fathers, look, I feel your pain, guys. I'm not better than you in this. This is a struggle for me like it is for you. We have a really hard time paying attention. Allah did not make men capable of paying attention to a lot of things. So it's a ni'mah of Allah that you're sitting here listening. Some of you are like, what? What? What just happened? Where am I? What is this place? <laughs> so we, we have a hard time paying attention. I mean, you get some of the best sleep of your life during khutbah al-jumu'ah, right? So that's, that's just who we are. We come here, the khatib begins in alhamdulillah. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> and then, aqim is salat, chalak, time ho gaya. You know, like that's, that's how we are. But you know what? And especially with our girls. Our girls, they, they, you know, little ones especially, they talk a lot. They don't stop talking. And they, Baba, Baba, you know what happened to school today? And they don't stop talking. And you know what? You have to actually sit there and listen. You have to actually listen to all of that bakwas. Pay attention and ask interesting questions about what they just said. Not, uh-huh, mm-hmm. Ah, shabash. Very good. Hmm. That's the most artificial I'm listening. And the girls know you're not listening. They know you're like, hmm, ha, ah, very good. Ha <laughs> ha. Like, they know. <laughs> they can see right through it. That's why girls are smart. Like one of my daughters, one time she knew I wasn't listening, right? She's telling me all this stuff. This happened at school and that happened. It's like, mm hmm, mm hmm. And she goes, Abba, you promised you'd give me $25. And I was like, mm hmm, mm hmm. And I. <laughs> And I was like, wait, 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 wait what? What? And she's like, hee hee. <laughs> you know? But they need, that. we have to find that with them. Don't come home late when the kids are already asleep. Don't do that. Don't be sleeping on the weekend until like 12. And the kids are just sitting there watching cartoons or whatever. If you don't build a relationship with them at early ages, they are not going to have a relationship with you by the time they're 13, 14. They're not. They're not going to be interested in you, in you because they, you weren't interested in them. You know, this is a balance you and I have to find. And especially fathers and daughters, that's a really important one. I talk, talked about this yesterday. But it starts early. This is a balance we have to find. And I'm, let me talk, tell you about some other aspects of balance. Our wives, many of them are very unhappy with us. They're very unhappy. And you get angry at them. I pay the bills, I go do the work, I provide everything. Look at this light, I turn it on, I turn it off. You see, you know why? Because I do all the work. Now let me watch CNN. Like, <laughs> and she says, you don't give me... A, and you're like, why are you always talking to your friend? Why are you always on the phone with her? You never get off the phone with her. Because you don't want to talk to her. How was, how was work? You're like, oh, this is work. I don't want to complicate your small brain with work, you know. Just, <laughs> just why don't you just cook or something. Just let me, let me deal with work, okay? You don't worry about it. Come on. If you keep neglecting them in conversation, then obviously they're going to be frustrated with you. They don't feel like they're a partner in, in, in your affairs. Some of the most crisis situations in the Prophet's life wasallam, he got the Ummahatul Mu'mineen involved. He got the mothers of the believers involved. In some of the most crisis situations. I learned this actually, I learned this later on in life. In, my, in, in our organization, when I'm about to hire somebody, I do the interview and I'm, I'm about to hire someone, I actually consult my wife before I make the final decision. You know? I, I value her input. I don't say, what does she know? Whatever. It actually helps the, it puts barakah in the work I do at work, but it also puts a lot of barakah in the home. This is important. Making them feel included. And part of that, 
balance guys. Now this is the hard part. You have to have my recommendation. This is not from our deen, but it's my personal recommendation. My recommendation is you should have one day at least in the week where you take care of the kids and they get to hang out with their friends. One day in the week where you're taking care of all the kids. I know, sounds like adab. I know. And they get to just socialize with their friends. And what that does is two things. One, it gives them room to breathe. Because it's hard taking care of kids. Two, it gives you an appreciation of how hard it is to take care of children. When you have to take care of children just by yourself for one hour. No, let's not make one hour, that's too long. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. You will feel like you are running out of oxygen. Where have you been? It's been like five hours. I thought you were going to talk to them and meet your friends and come back. What are you coming back next week? What is going on here? I haven't even left. I was just leaving. It hasn't even been five minutes. For you, it's very hard. And that's actually an indication that you haven't spent enough time with your children. That's why you're not comfortable spending 100% of your time without any you know, female supervision with them. It's kind of hard. This is part of balance. Your mother wants to spend time with you, but your wife says, don't go to your mother's house. Your mother, you go to your mother's house, hey, I never want to see your wife, I hate her. And you're, these two women, I don't know what happened, you don't want to know what happened, but they hate each other. They really, really hate each other. And guess what? They're not going to tell each other that they hate each other. Who are they going to tell all the time? You, one year over here, one year over here. And you're going to have to balance the insane rage of two women, you know, and you have to show both of them love. And every time you go, and you, you forget to call your mother, she says, your wife told you not to call me, ha? Huh? I knew it, I knew it. And then you go spend a little 20 minutes at your mom's house, your wife calls, why don't you just live there then? Why don't you... And in the middle of it all, you, and they ask, why are you balding so fast then? You know, <laughs> why are you losing your hair so quickly? Well, here, here's how you do something about that. First of all, you, because you have to maintain the sanity of your household, you have to learn to not get frustrated with your women, with your mother, with your wife, with your father, etc. etc. So you, you should not get frustrated with them. So if your mother says, I hate your wife, you says, yeah, we should kill her together. Let's do it. <laughs> if your wife says, never talk to your mother again, it's like, yeah, you're right. I just, you know what? Never. I'm, I'm deleting her number right now. <laughs> you know? Can I delete your mother's number too? <laughs> right. But you have to learn to joke it off a little bit. You, if they have a lot of tension, you have to release the tension. You have to release the tension. And you cannot, and part of this balance, and we haven't learned this in much of the ummah, you did not marry a servant, you married a wife. You married someone who is somebody's daughter, and they used to protect her and take care of her, and give her dignity, and now that became your responsibility. You did not marry a maid for your mother. You did not marry a servant for your mother, that's not our deen. You cannot tell her to, to you know, treat your mother like you treat your mother. You owe your mother. You owe your mother. Your wife doesn't owe your mother. You have to, this is part of balance. She has a haq on you. And she, she's responsible to you. And you cannot make her do things that she's, that's not even part of the agreement. They say, you're gonna do this for my mother, you're gonna massage her feet, you're gonna do this, and you're gonna do that, and you're gonna get treated like garbage, because we've watched in enough Indian movies to know that that's how things are supposed to be. <laughs> And they get to. And you can What's going on here? Phone is because of the sweat and tears of your father, and the the sacrifices of your mother. Show some respect. Show a little bit of respect for what they've gone through. You know, it's not easy earning a living. It's not. You try doing it. You try doing it if you think it's that easy. Stop being a baby and asking for and throwing tantrums and having attitude problems. Learn to be act like mature adults. You know, as far I was telling the younger group earlier, as far as our religion is concerned, if you are, if you reached maturity, in other words, if you reached uh, the age of puberty, men and women, as far as our deen is concerned, you are adults. You better start acting like it. 
Stop acting like, just because your friends around you are acting like children doesn't mean you have to. And if the friends around you are really immature, find older friends. Honestly, find older friends, there's no harm in that. And you sp spend time with older people, it'll mature you faster. Spend time with them. If your dad's running a business, spend time with him at the business. It'll mature you faster. If, they, if your mom goes to a halaqa with older ladies, go join it. It's gonna be boring for a little while, but then you'll mature. You'll learn from the wisdom of elders. It'll make you smarter. It'll make you more mature. This is, these are important things. And so now I'm giving advice to the teenage boys in particular, and the young, young men in particular. Please listen to this carefully. I'm, based on my personal experience. This is advice only based on my personal experience. Honestly, my, my parents, because of financial reasons and job reasons, they had to leave the United States when I was young, when I was about 17, 18 years old. So we had to make a... My sister just got married, my older sister, she was living in New Jersey. I was going at, to college and I had a job in New York, but I lived with my family. But they had to make the decision to go back. And because of my education, they decided that I should stay back in New York by myself. So I'm a guy that's 17, 18 years old, by myself, living in New York City. I have no parental supervision. I can do whatever I want in the day and whatever I want at night. I can do whatever I want with my time. Nobody's gonna check on me. Nobody's gonna check who I called, or who I text message, or what websites I visit, or who I hang out with, or what I listen to, or what I watch. Nobody's gonna check. I have no supervision over me, none. On top of that, I'm making my own money. I don't owe anybody money. I have my own job. I'm earning it myself. I'm completely independent. That, that age, independence and New York City are not a good combination. That's not a good combination. That is a lethal combination. You understand? You know the... And I, I didn't survive that because I'm some righteous person. I didn't. I survived that only and only because I was too busy to do something stupid. Too busy. I was taking 12 credits in college, I was working 40 hours a week, and the little empty time I had, somehow I developed the interest to want to learn Arabic. So I, was, I used to have 20 hour days. I got 4 hours of sleep a day. And I was loving it. I was exhausted. I didn't have time to be an idiot. You know the biggest crisis of young men today? Free time. You got free time, that's just trouble. And you don't have to be in no New York City. The internet is widely available, huh? New York City can come to you. Our young men have to do work. If they're too young to get a job, put them in an internship. If they're old enough, put them in the business with you. Have them sit in the office with you. Make them, do, make them make photocopies or do something else. Keep them busy. Keep young men busy. Exhaust them. If they don't want to do work, put them in sports. Don't have them sit idle. Young men sitting idle, you are guaranteed to have trouble. It's not you might have trouble. You will have trouble. There's no other way of thinking about it. There's no, there's no second option. It is absolutely guaranteed. Absolutely guaranteed. Young guys, you want to save yourselves, get a job early. What's the earliest age you can get a job in this country? I don't know what that is. 18? I don't know. Is it? Oh, the second you turn 18, get a job. I don't care if you're changing tires at a tire shop. Get a job. I've gone through maybe 15 jobs in my youth. That just means I got fired a lot, by the way. <laughs> But regardless, it saved me. And the other thing it does, let me tell you what a job does, it makes a man out of you. When you get yelled at by your boss, man, when you get paid almost nothing for doing like back-breaking work, you get respect for money. You get respect for what you earn. You get new respect for your father. You get new respect for them taking care of an entire household. You don't complain anymore that they didn't get you the newest toy and the newest video game. Because you know what it takes to earn that kind of money. New respect. I had a very wealthy friend, who, whose son, smart kid, he graduated high school, A student, you know, got, a, got, got into a college, and his father was so proud of him, bought him a BMW. Brand new. Three series. Nice car. 
crashed it in two months. Oops. Dad yelled at him, car's beyond repair. A month or two went by, he convinced his father to buy him a Lexus. Six months go by, he crashed that too. Then the father called me and said, what should I do? Two cars this boy has already destroyed. And I was like, why? You are so smart. If you were not smart, you wouldn't be making that kind of money. Why are you so dumb with your child? What happens to your brain? Stop things. Tell them, earn it yourself. Go buy your own car. Go get a job. And so this boy gets a job. He worked at the Gap, folding t-shirts. Right? And he's earning minimum wage and he's putting dollar after dollar together until he gets about $2,000 together and he bought like a 1988 Buick and he's shining that thing every day and he's he loves it, he takes pictures of it and he's it's never crashed it stays under the speed limit even give it a name <laughs> Basanti Why, why, did he, why did he have such, so much respect for this car? It's the ugliest car he has. He had a Lexus before this, he had a BMW before this. This is a hideous car. But you know what? This was from his own earnings. His respect for it. We have to give our kids respect for money. You know, if, they, if we keep giving them things, they will not have respect for money. They won't have respect for money. It's really important we do that. You know? The same thing with, with, with girls, if you can find work, do it. If not, volunteer. Volunteer at a hospital, volunteer at a clinic. Help out at a shelter. Do things, Just keep yourself busy. Especially at that critical age and it will save you from a lot, a lot, a lot of trouble. These are just some things about balance and responsibility that I wanted to highlight. I, I just want to leave you guys with the following. If we, subhanAllah, we raise our children, we, we, we want the best for our children, and we want them to have the best things in life. Sometimes you feel like, I'm earning all this money, what's the point of it if I can't give my children a good life? Right? So you buy them things and you get them things out of love for them. Obviously, it's a natural feeling that a parent has. But I am telling you that if you keep buying things for your children, then you are actually poisoning them. You're actually hurting them, not helping them. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy things for your children, but you should taper it off. And you should not make it like a regular thing. Where they just become greedy and want, just they, all they do is they want from you. And all you, all, they are, all you are to them is a cash register. That's a sad state, you know. That's not where you and I want to be. The best thing, I keep saying it, I keep saying it, I keep saying it. The best thing you can give your children is time. Go to Umrah with them. Go to Umrah regularly with them. You have, you're such an awesome... Can you, can you, I can't tell you what I would give to be able to go to Umrah with my children. How awesome that would be. And you guys can do that like... Chalo, chalte, chalo, dil chala, chale. You just get up and go. So easy for you. Take advantage of that. Do road trips with them. Do activities with them. You know? If you have the means, travel with them. It builds a bond. And especially fathers. This is, I'll tell you fathers one last time. If you take, if you have a lot of children, because we're Muslims, so you know, chances are. But if you take a couple of your children, just you and two of your children, three of your children, and you go on a trip, and spend time with them 24-7, you're responsible for them sleeping, waking up, eating, drinking, everything. Mom's not around. It will, even if you do that for five days, six days, ten days, whatever, it will build a real connection with you and your children. It's really important. Make time to do that. Even if you don't go somewhere exotic, it doesn't matter. If you just go like down the street somewhere, go stay at a friend, a cousin's house or something. Do something like that. But do make the time outside of your regular routine with your children, it builds that bond. I, I wanted to highlight only family responsibilities. There are more things I wanted to talk to you about like work responsibilities and balance at the workplace. Paying your employees fairly, right? Paying your taxes fairly not cheating in you know, your, your financial transactions, not lying in financial reports, not overbilling people when you're a consultant. Right? So you bill them for 500 hours, but you only did 200 hours of work, but it's okay, slip it in. 
That's also a part of losing balance. We have to become Allah tatgaw fil mizan wa aqimu al wazna bil qist wa la tukhsiru al mizan. Two ayat are dedicated of making sure we stay on balance. So I pray that Allah Azza wa Jalla makes us a balanced ummah, a people that are trying to find, uh, you know, uh, uh, e- find a way to give equal rights to every side. That I pray that we have balanced husbands and balanced wives and balanced children and you know balanced parents in this entire ummah. And I pray Allah Azza wa Jalla accepts all of the efforts that we do. Thank you so very much for listening to me these last couple of nights. Before I take a few questions from you guys, I just wanted to make one quick announcement if you can pay attention, inshaAllah ta'ala. And that is that I, my, my mission, some of you are familiar already, my mission in life is to try to make two things easy for the ummah. I'd like to make the Arabic language easy for Muslims. And I think for a long time we've been intimidated by this language. And we, there's a way to learn it without being scared of it. It's, it's easy. Allah made it easy. And one of my missions is to help you know, make it easy for as many Muslims across the world learn this language as best as possible. The second thing I'd like to do is to help the Ummah understand at least the basics of the Qur'an. And eventually even at the, at the deepest levels. I want to be able to explain it to you and to highlight to you what are, what's missing in translation. There are so many wonderful things in the Qur'an that we just overlook, right? And they're so beautiful that when you find them out, you're like, well, I was missing this. I could, have u- I could really use this in my life, you know? So I discovered those things for myself and I felt like the ummah should know. People should know about this and I don't feel enough is being done. And I'm not saying I'm the only one you can learn from, but I'm saying that inshallah, if I can start a trend, maybe others far more talented than myself can come along and further this awareness of the Qur'an. So I'm trying to put an effort together where at least a family, an average Muslim family, that's not super knowledgeable, that isn't versed in Arabic, you don't know what tafsir is necessarily, maybe you have a translation of the Qur'an at home, and chances are you found that confusing too at many times. If that's your scenario, I'd like to be able to teach you the entire Qur'an in simple language, especially paying attention to the parts that are really confusing in translation. You know, what, what do those parts in particular mean? So for that effort, I, my, my team and I have dedicated ourselves to building a video library of Qur'an studies and a video li- library of Arabic studies. The Qur'an studies video library from beginning to end, it's called the Cover to Cover Project and it's on Bayina TV. Bayina.tv Some of you are subscribed to that and some of you, this is the first time you're hearing about it. My request to you is that tonight inshallah ta'ala you guys check it out. Those of you that have it, please share the information with others. Share the resource that you have with friends and family. Many of you are benefiting from it and many of you are not. My hopes are as many people across the world benefit from this resource as possible. I'm doing things like parenting from the Qur'anic perspective, the entire series on it, shame from the Qur'anic perspective, haya, entire series on it. I eventually am going to do you know, uh, women heroes in the Qur'an entire series on it. The things that I need, I, I want to have these things available for my daughters. And if my daughters will benefit, then the daughters of the Ummah will benefit, I believe it. I believe that. Why should I restrict that to my own child? You know, I have concern for all of our children. That's what we're supposed to have, a shared concern for the Ummah. The same thing, I really want to teach my children Arabic, but I could have just taught her myself, but I decided to record the classes. I teach my, do- my 10-year-old daughter like Arabic grammar to understand the Qur'an. And some of you are following Arabic with Husna online. It's all there on Bayina TV. So I want you to be able to access this resource and inshallah ta'ala over the years benefit more and more from it. One of the exciting things I want to tell some of you might not know or you do know, we have a full-time Arabic studies program back in Texas where, I, where I'm from. And I, most of my year is spent teaching that. I take 60 students and I beat Arabic into them. And I, I, I'm not like this when I'm in class. I'm a very mean teacher. <laughs> You know, because uh, Dallas, in Dallas, right? So it's a nine-month program. And it's hard for you folks to come all the way out there, and it's, I can understand that. And now there's a demand for that kind of a program to exist all over the world. So I'm hoping within the next year and a half, I put the machinery in place to be able to replicate that program all over the place and in places like Bahrain, inshaAllah ta'ala. So that the working professionals here, the mothers here, the women and the men here, the youth and the adults here that are interested in Quranic Arabic can take advantage of our successful curriculum. It's already helped thousands of people in the US, why can't it help other people all over the world? 
Why not, inshaAllah ta'ala? And I'm hoping to produce teachers from within you. Like to take a few of you, train them, and then start them off in your own communities, inshaAllah ta'ala, when the time is right. I need about a year and a half to put all those things in place. But I'm announcing that to you now, so you guys remember that project in your dua. That we're able to do that, inshaAllah ta'ala, for the, 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 the men in our community and the women in our community here. It was just an absolute pleasure getting to talk to you guys today. I hope you guys benefited from today's conversation. I can only take three or so questions from the brother side and three or so questions from the sister side. We'll go one and one. Try to be as loud as you possibly can when you ask. Show of hands. Anybody on the guy's side? Yes. The sisters. There is no responsibility without trust. You have me and what you think about it. Okay. Good questions. It's been said that there are no rights without responsibilities, and there are no responsibilities without rights. And what do you think about that? Uh, I think a lot of things about that. First of all, let's talk about our relationship with Allah. Okay? Allahu Rabbuna. Allah is our Rabb which makes us abd, right? And by definition, a abd has no rights. An employee, a muwaddaf has rights. A amil has rights. But a abd has no rights, yes? But Allah gives us gifts anyway. So Allah has all the rights and we have none of the rights. I don't have a right to have two arms. I don't have a right to have two legs. I don't have that right. These are gifts from Allah, you understand? But within human relationships, yes, there are rights and there are responsibilities. So in a marriage, I have certain rights as a husband and I have some responsibilities as a husband. You have certain rights as a wife and certain responsibilities as a wife. You have rights as children, responsibilities as children. It's always going to be there. However, what is the relationship between them? This is the important part. In every one of those relationships, in every one of those relationships, the mistake people make is they're always looking for their rights. That's the mistake they make. Children are looking for their rights, parents are looking for their rights, husbands are looking for their rights, wives are looking for their rights. And everybody says, if I get my rights, I will fulfill my responsibilities. Right? That's the mentality for most people. And guess what? When you have that mentality, when the husband says, I will, get, I will give my responsibilities when I get my rights. And the wife says, well, I will give my responsibilities when I get my rights. Both of you will have a miserable marriage. Chances are you're Pakistani. Right? That's, <laughs> that's what, that, that's what that's going to do. The right way to go about this. What you got for me? Questions? Man. Yeah, I know I got a flight. Yeah. So the, the, the right way to think about this is, Muslims have to concern themselves with their responsibilities. And they have to stop expecting their rights. You have to stop expecting your rights. And by the way, when you lose your expectations, then you only start expecting from Allah. And then even if you get a little bit, you're really happy. And when you keep expecting from people, you're always disappointed. You're just gonna leave, you're gonna be miserable all the time. Because let me tell you, there's no, there's no way your husband's going to be meeting your expectations. <laughs> You're like, oh, I believe that. That's the first thing he said that I agree with. You know? <laughs> there's no way. But if you... Stop it. Stop it. No. I'm not going to stop. No. Are they going to turn the lights off? Is that what they're going to do? Oh yeah? Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that question. There, there's two more questions. Um, Salam alaikum, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I would like to know, should we force children 7, to 8, to 9 years old to pray when they don't want to? Why don't they want to? What is wrong with you? What have you been doing? And what, what do you mean force them to pray? You can encourage them to pray. You could, yes. Okay. Yeah. No, it's it, at that age I would I actually believe in being forceful a little bit. Like a measured forceful, not like a super crazy like, you know, slap you across the room forceful, but 
forceful enough that they say, okay, mom's serious. I better pray. And you can't say, well, they're, then they're praying for the sake of mom and not for the sake of Allah. At a certain age, they have to do that. They have to pray for the sake of meeting mom's expectations. And as they mature, they'll thank you for building that habit into them. Right? So that it's important to be, we be a little bit of an authority. We can't be softies in all, all of our parenting. We can't do that. Okay, one last question. You talked about responsibility. What is the responsibility each Muslim has towards the Qur'an? How much minimum Qur'an should we read daily? That, that was my last question. Okay, fine. Okay, how much uh, Qur'an should we read daily? As much as you can. As much as you can. But don't... I, I keep talking about balance, right? Find a time in your day where you can give to Allah's book. My recommendation is after Fajr or before Fajr. Around that time, 10, 15, 20 minutes, if you can recite Qur'an, you're good. Even if you, can, if you can't give 20 minutes, give 10 minutes. The ummah is at such a low point, I don't want to put high expectations on you. Just start somewhere, read something. Read something from Allah's book. You know? And, and you guys get tra stuck in traffic a lot, I'm guessing. Yes? So have beneficial things to listen to in the car. Have recitation to listen to. Go through a surah that you're memorizing over and over again. Listen to a tafsir in the car, something. Keep, keep that up as a habit, inshallah ta'ala, in the car. Okay, last question and I'm gone. Jazakallahu khairan for each and every word that you delivered. My question is, how can we strive balance among non-mahram colleagues and family? You live in a non-Muslim country where shaking hands is showing respect. So how can we say no without hurting them? Was it about you or me? I don't know. <laughs> but... Um, Look, we're, I mean, at least in the United States, we're a pretty free society, right? So you could do pretty much anything. You could shake feet in America. You can do the silliest things. So when, when you know, a woman sticks out her hand, some people are comfortable with shaking her hand and they'll quote a fatwa or something and whatever. I'm personally not comfortable uh, shaking hands with women. I'm not giving you a fatwa. I'm just saying I'm personally not comfortable. And I'll just say, you know, I, I just... Uh, we have this thing in our family where we only, we, we only touch women within our family and we have too much respect for women outside to, we don't have the privilege to be able to touch them. It's a thing. It's a Muslim thing. You know? So I, instead of turning it into something like, Ew, you kafir, I can't touch you. I turn it into, uh, listen, just out of respect for women, unless they're in our family, we don't, get the, we don't have the right to touch them. It's a, I hope you can respect that. And they do. We just gotta find a smart way of saying things. You know, you don't have to just say, you know, well, we believe in the mushrikun and najas. We believe that the mushrikun are filth. And you clearly a mushrik. Um, so you're lucky I don't have a gas mask on right now to tolerate your presence. Uh, and therefore, shaking my hand is out of the question. But here's my sock. You can shake that. <laughs> That's another way of going. You decide which one suits your personality more. <laughs> Thank you so very much everybody. Jazakumullahu khairan for listening. I have to rush out of here because I have to catch a flight tonight. And if I don't, I am going to be Zabiha at home. So, Jazakumullahu uh, khairan. Please make lots of dua for me. I'll be making lots and lots of dua for you on my trip back. Be responsible people. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Yeah, come.